Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Center. But my function today is uh, to chair this issue of the Bookworm series and to welcome very great with great joy uh, Wei Wang, who's the head of the Department of Chinese Studies here at the University of Sydney, who is going to talk about the ethnic identities of the Kam people that he's been recently researching on. Before I do that, I would like to acknowledge the uh, original owners of the land on which the university is based, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. This land was never ceded, it was taken from them. The land is theirs, and we respect their elders, past, present, and emerging. In the session that is about to start now, if you, at the end, there'll be time for asking questions. If you have a question, please use the Q&A facility on the bottom of the Zoom page, and uh, we will uh, ask the questions of Wei. So now, without further ado, over to Wei, who is um, uh, going to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, uh, for making your time to uh, come into today's session. Um, First, let me uh, allow me to share my screen with you. I've got some PowerPoints here to share. Um, in today's talk, basically, I will introduce my newly published book uh, called entitled Ethnic Identity of the Camp People in Contemporary China, Government versus Local Perspectives. This book is actually um, uh, collaboration between myself and one um, China-based anthropologist, uh, Li Songjiang, who is um, a social professor in Southwest University in Chongqing. And uh, he's basically uh, a specialist in doing research on ethnic minority people in Southwest China. And um, he is a key person who provide me with access to the fieldwork site and also provide me with a huge amount of um, background knowledge, uh, the current kind of status quo of ethnic minorities in China. And all the um, background knowledge basically provided by him and all the analysis actually done by myself. So uh, this work is actually initiated in 2015 when we had a meeting together in Chongqing. We discussed to work together on a research project. And then he provided me with access to this um, fieldwork site, which is in Chongjiang, um, very remote county in Guizhou province. And it's on the border uh, of uh, Guizhou, uh, Guangxi and uh, Hunan. I will, I will give you more details immediately. And then we started our field work in 2016, and uh, we visited that village and that county seven times, definitely intermittently. And I hired three research assistants to help me to, to do all the research interviews. And um, we had done our field work um, for three years there, okay? And uh, altogether, we have uh, recruited 34 uh, active participants in the village. And for each participants, we interview them more than once. And in general, we have um, produced um, 30, 62, around 62 hours audio, uh, audio recording, then uh, which have been transcribed into more than 1,500 pages of scripts and for my detailed linguistic analysis. Um, and uh, just because my background is um, uh, discourse analysis. So I did all the detailed analysis based on uh, the empirical kind of data that I connected, including the research interviews, um, uh, government archives and uh, uh, public media articles, all that kind of things there, yeah, including, of course, my own yeah. observation, observation uh, notes as well. So luckily, we completed our field work before COVID, and then we did some uh, a follow-up kind of interview, distant online interview in early 1920s. 
And uh, I wrote up these uh, scripts basically later 19, uh, 20, 2020 and 2021. So luckily this book was published by Rutledge uh, late last year. So before I um, discuss my, my project, I just would like to give you uh, some brief idea of the camp people in Chinese we say Dong, Dong people. Okay, Dong Zhu, yeah. Basically uh, uh, ethnic minority uh, residing in, in uh, the border of um, Guizhou, Guangxi and Hunan. And according to the Chinese census, um, now currently there are about 2.8 million uh, Dong people there. And uh, in general, they are practicing intensive farming, okay? And quite a lot of them, uh, quite a lot of young people um, coming to the coastal area uh, as, a, as a migrant worker currently. So this kind of uh, social change transformation in this area really make um, a, a huge impact on people's own conception, conceptualization, representation of their own ethnic culture and identity. And also for Dong people, they are famous for their grand choir, Dong Zhu Da Ge, which is a UNESCO um, um, listed um, uh, world her cultural heritage. And just because of these Dong Zhu Da Ge make um, Dong people um, a uh, very high kind of profile in the Chinese public media recently. On the other hand, just because they're sharing the same physical characteristics and also uh, nearly most of them can speak um, Chinese uh, Han language, dialects or Mandarin. So make them invisible in the, really the social society. This kind of contrastive identities on one hand, high profile in social media, on the other, invisible in public side, make it a very interesting kind of ethnic group. So arouse my interest to really do some research on these ethnic group there. And um, uh, before I, I um, talked about my, my main uh, goal for my research, I just like to introduce you the cultural reconstruction campaign for Chinese ethnic minorities from 1950s. Actually, uh, this uh, is a uh, cultural reconception is a concept with very complex kind of connotation in um, Chinese discourse systems uh, that promotes excellent traditional culture and a great rejuvenation of Chinese nation. And basically um, the developmental kind of trajectory following a U shape, that is what I say, um, in doing this kind of cultural reconstruction. In 1950s, um, because of uh, the campaign of ethnic minority classification and the regional ethnic autonomy, and basically it's uh, uh, enjoying a, a prosperous kind of uh, phase um, until 90, before the Cultural Revolution, until 1960s. And then during the Cultural Revolution up to 1990s, it goes down to the bottom of the uh, uh, U-shape there, uh, just because uh, namely uh, ethnic identity is being, being regarded as a kind of symbol of backwardness and uh, uh, poverty. And also uh, during that period time, uh, ethnic minorities, ethnic people um, uh, experiencing a rapid integration and simulation, uh, simulation into the ethnic hunt. And after 90, uh, 2000, um, people, local people, and uh, the government um, are re-conceptualizing uh, ethnic identity, ethnic identity culture. And they put a lot of efforts, uh, putting quite a lot of investment to rejuvenize, uh, reconstruct the ethnic culture, ethnic identity with a view uh, to take ethnic culture as a source of uh, economic growth. They uh, quite, quite often do repackage ethnic culture in various kinds of ways. Here, actually, my research is very much based on the current kind of context that the government tried to invest and try to do 
a lot of things to rejuvenize ethnic culture there. That's a general kind of um, background of, uh, of uh, this kind of cultural reconstruction campaign. And for my own uh, research, just because quite a lot of you here might have known that my background is um, in social linguistics and discourse studies. So um, my work is uh, actually to examine the discursive practices of the two most important kind of agents in this cultural reconstru reconstruction campaign. And I draw on discourse uh, oriented ethnography and relevant sociological kind of theories like Gers, uh, uh, Goffman's kind of theories to investigate the discourse practices of the two most important agents. One is the local government, the other is the local minority people. And what kind of discursive strategies or practices they have employed in reconstructing their ethnic culture and identity. The data um, that I collected during these uh, three years of field work, including the government and communal archives, interviews, field work notes, on site language signs, and media articles, also videos. So um, for today's talk, definitely it's not possible for me to cover everything, every aspect uh, that I covered in the book. And I just like to uh, highlight and give you some key kinds of findings or, you know, um, without uh, digging to very technical kind of part of my linguistic analysis there. And uh, before I'm doing that, I will introduce you, give you more idea about the few work site that I really um, doing my research. And basically uh, we visited this part. This is a, this is an area in China on the border of Guizhou, Hunan, and Guangxi. And the shadow part is where Han people are really living. So you can see the majority of the Han are living in Guizhou. And this is, if you don't know uh, where is Guizhou, Hunan, and Guangxi, you can see it's actually in uh, southwest of China there. Yeah. And uh, the village that I, I did my field work mostly uh, um, uh, is uh, Sanli, it's called Sanli. Uh, it um, consists of 168 uh, households uh, and of um, 791 camp people, or all, all camp people there. Yeah. And the village, um, everyone's surname is Wu, <laughs> Later on, where I will discuss uh, why Wu uh, uh, is a surname there, what kind of stories behind there. It's in the Chongjiang uh, County, Qian Dongnan, Miao, and Dong Autonomous uh, pref uh, Prefectures in Guizhou Province. And um, it's about uh, 20 something kilometers away. This uh, village is uh, 25 kilometers away from its countryside. The Songjiang. And um, when I did my, uh, my last trip there is in 2019. At that time, still no public transport linking this village to the, to the countryside. You need to drive by yourself there. Otherwise, um, there's irregular kind of um, public uh, transport, bumpy country road there. Of course, Songjiang is now um, uh, linked by uh, Gautie. It's an express train already, and in that county, it's very easy to reach uh, uh, Guiyang, uh, the, the uh, provincial capital, and also Guilin and uh, Guangzhou, and, and this, uh, all the express trains linked into the county there. And uh, this is the picture that I talked with uh, local residents. This is um, one of my uh, research assistants there uh, doing the, all the recording for me. You can see the old people are still clad in their ethnic um, clothing. And for the younger or middle-aged people, their dressing is exactly the same as the majority. Huh? And um, uh, all the people, I think under 60s can speak, uh, can speak um, uh, 
Mandarin uh, fairly understandably well, <laughs> understandably well. So it's no problem. And also one of my one of my research assistants can speak that local dialect. So it make my my field work um, um, so easy there. And um, I very quickly, I just give a very quick kind of um, uh, 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 introduction of the discourse. What, what do I mean by discourse oriented kind of ethnography? It's actually uh, uh, interdisciplinary kind of efforts used to explore the interrelationship between language use, individuals, culture, and society. It emphasized importance of incorporating ethnic, uh, ethnography into linguistic studies. And um, in traditional or, or conventional kind of linguistic studies, the focusing on text or language itself. But for, for um, discourse-oriented ethnography, or sometimes we call linguistic ethnography, we try to incorporate ethnic, uh, as, uh, ethnographic kind of studies, ethnographic kind of work into our linguistic analysis. So quite often uh, we use recursive kind of analysis, um, basically following a kind of um, uh, cyclical kind of pattern of data connection, analysis, reflection, and possible redirection of our research in light of the previous data connection, analysis, and reflection. And also for myself, I'm following Gertz kind of framework that um, first of all, I try to um, conceptualize the experience by using experienced near kind of concepts, that is the first order kind of constructs of the reality, basically uh, retrieved from the uh, research interviews or the kind of linguistic materials that I connected. And then I try to further conceptualize it by using experience distant concepts there. So in terms of experience distant concept, I draw on heavily on uh, Goffman's work, especially his frame analysis. And I, I, I found, although um, for, for social linguists, um, for, for people with a knowledge about Goffman, maybe uh, you know, his work is mainly uh, used to conceptualize the, the immediate kind of interactions between people. And, but I found that his work is also very relevant uh, to my work as uh, when I'm doing these uh, discourse oriented kind of um, ethnography there. So the, the terms of concepts like strip, frame, muffin, stunt, key, rekey, fabrication, I found it very, very useful there to reconceptualize what I have already observed. Um, or analyzed from my data. And um, in terms of discursive practices that I identified in my book, there's quite a big range of different kinds of pra practices by these uh, key agents, the local government versus the local people. So uh, for example, for the lo local government, they, they try to draw on the intangible cultural heritage protection as a kind of key thing there for them to protect uh, or reconstruct the ethnic culture. And also the key framing is a very important kind of skill or, or discursive strategies that they used. And here today, I will give you some example of their, what do I mean by key framing? And also introducing ethnic culture into schools. It's a big, big project um, in local China that uh, they, they introduced some elements, selected elements of ethnic um, cultures into the basic uh, school systems, um, uh, primary school and uh, secondary school systems, uh, system, uh, their curriculums there. And for local people, uh, from the local, perfect, local people's per perspective, elite fabrication is a very important kind of um, discursive practice. I will introduce that. And then the distance from the home, the mobility experience really influenced their own representation and negotiation of their, of their, um, of their identity, ethnic identity. I, um, I uh, didn't have time to introduce you that part. That part is also a very key kind of uh, 
um, uh, components of my of my research, and also commodification of the appetite that is very obviously there. And wait, and, could I stop you a minute. Uh, could you sorry. could you um, make your screen um, larger? Could you okay. put your PowerPoint on full screen? Okay. By clicking on the uh, the um, um, sure. icon down well, the. That's it. Well done. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, because of the time, I, I, I could not, it's not possible for me to cover every single discursive aspect, uh, discursive strategies that they use. What I will give you some example is uh, for, from the government point of view, I will talk about kids framing. What do I mean by kid framing? From the local people's perspective, I'll give you two examples about their elite fabrication of their ethnic culture there. And uh, for local governments, key framing, and uh, this actually key framing, a uh, key and framing is both of these two concepts are, uh, that I draw from Goffman. We interpret framing as a deliberate kind of interpretation, purposeful branding of ethnic culture in the process of cultural reconstruction. And key framing in these study uh, use this term to refer to the local government's deliberate efforts in framing the essential features of ethnic culture and developing operational plan in compliance with the guiding principles of the established keys for the, from the central government. They got some guiding principles and established keys. And this is a rebreeding kind of process that aimed at creating a distinctive and appealing image for ethnic culture and identity. This is what I mean by key framing. And for the keys, first let's discuss the keys. The keys from the local government, from the central government is basically realizing the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, inheriting the excellent tradition of Chinese culture, developing uh, original as not uh, ecological kind of ethnic culture, blah, blah, blah. These are some of the keys that uh, the local government are used. And for the Chongjiang, Chongjiang County, I found uh, the key framing that they, they used of the Chongjiang County local government. This is actually from their government, you can read here. This is a local government website. Okay, you can, you can, you can have a look there. If, on the top of their website, you can see that's a key framing that they that the local government use basically mean meaning mystical Chongjiang, a sacred land to nourish hard this is what they frame their land there and here i just uh, very quickly try to play uh, a, a very short uh, video clip this is uh, actually from their uh, local government website this is the website link if you like to watch the full version of this clip you can you can you can have a look there and uh, this is a promotional kind of uh, video video clip that they that they how to how they operationalize this kind of key frame. Let me try to play it with it. This world has too many unexpected things. 人生就像一场旅行，我们抵达，再出发百年古墓的沉香，深邃久远的记忆，在古寨的歌谣中流淌。鼓楼三百年的坚守，是先人记忆的丰碑，典藏着这淳朴岁月的芬芳，成就了这令人沉醉的人间烟火。Sorry, I have to stop here because of the time. 
And sorry, there's no uh, English subtitle here, but purposely I stopped here just because this is the Zhanli village that I will discuss immediately after. You can see here, actually, um, while they frame Chongjiang as a mysterious lane, at the same time, they're giving, the, the, just because this video is prepared by the county government, they're giving key framing to the township and villages under their governance there. It's very interesting. So um, you can see in this video, video uh, clip that Chongjiang uh, had been described like uh, uh, and all the kind of, you know, big, uh, very, uh, very beautiful words to, to highlight the two kinds of elements, the two elements that being crystallized into Chongjiang's cultural identity. One is hard narration, the other is being mystical. So which reflect the local government's overall perception of their local ethnic culture. As I just mentioned, um, that um, these kind of frame, uh, key frame kind of practice is a top-down process done by, from I, I, what I observed is done from uh, the provincial government. For the provincial government, my, maybe they worked out the key framing for their local cities. And for the cities, uh, they worked out uh, the framing for, their, for, the, for the counties, and counties working out the key framing for the local township or village. So these actually, the exact kind of video clips actually prepared by Chongjiang County, they promote the, this kind of two elements. At the same time, they give um, these uh, key framing kind of work to, their, to, to the local villages as well. So that's something they are doing. That's something exactly for the local, local, local uh, governments are doing there with a view um, to uh, pursuing uh, uh, economic or, or, or tourist, uh, tourism kind of development there. And um, this kind of a newly developed frame has clearly uh, clear kind of referential characteristics that essentially reflects a government's kind of stunt or extra, extraordinary kind of control in reconstructing the ethnic culture of the uh, uh, minority groups. They didn't, you know, when they are when they are working out these kind of frames. What I read from their doc, uh, government documents and archives, they didn't really seek the opinion of the local ethnic people at all. I can very rarely they're doing that. They just invite some uh, academics or so-called scholars or or, or or government officials to have a forum or discussion meeting and what kind of key frame they can work out for each, uh, each um, uh, village or, 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 or township there. This is, um, th this is uh, the key frame is uh, discursive, the most obvious kind of discursive uh, strategies that local government are using. Okay, let's, uh, because I, I, I have to, to go to the second part, that is the local people. Whether or not the local people are uh, really passive recipient of this kind of key frame or not? No, it's not necessarily so. So um, confronted by the impact of state power, uh, commodification of the traditional ethnic culture, and the local people has adopted their own discursive st strategies rather than only accepted the top-down key frame passively. This is what I found. They seek to benefit from the official key framing and the market demand with a view to securing and expanding their own space for cultural survival and develop, development. Elite fabrication, that is, that is basically the elite villages reinterpreted or even fabricated their local history for the sake of the tourism development. This is a very obvious strategy taken by the elite villages there. This is what I found. And uh, uh, here I give you two examples. They are interestingly based on my own field work in the Zhanli village. This is a statue of ancestral roots of that village standing at the entrance of uh, the Zhanli village in memory of two brothers, uh, brother Wu Zhang and Wu Li. This is the name that they gave, that they gave 
to to um, these two these two statues here. And the inscriptions below of this uh, statue, this here, read something like this. You can read if you can read Chinese. You can read there. I didn't want to go through. Okay. And basically, they give Xiangchuan, uh, 1368年2月1日, okay, 战离祖先, 无上和族, 无离两兄弟. Basically, uh, they, they create a story about these two brothers coming to, to, uh, from Guangxi to, the, uh, to settle down in this village in 1368. And they gave the exact date there. That's uh, February the 1st. Uh, 1368, and then they give the name of these two uh, brothers there, okay? And they think just because uh, the village's name is Zanli, so actually according to this statue is from the surnames of these two brothers, Wu Zhan and Wu Li, and comes to Zanli. This is what they get. This is the story told by these statue here. Actually, um, according to the name system of uh, Kan people, they adopted this kind of, um, this kind of name. Uh, basically, it's follow a Chinese uh, uh, Han people's name, uh, naming, naming systems, rather than they are following the traditional, <laughs> traditional Kan people's naming at all. They didn't have Basically, they didn't have their, their surname. They didn't, for, for traditional ancient pe uh, people, ancient camp people, they didn't have their surnames at all. And um, this kind of uh, Zanli, and also um, in terms of the Zanli itself as a, as a village name, Li in, in um, Kan dialect is very much a suffix that they use to refer to a place name like Chun or Zhuang or Dian in Han's language. So it's a very obviously, they, this, is a, this is a elite fabrication of their, of their origin of the village, village name, is the first thing. Second is about the historical era identification. That's more ridiculous. And just because um, maybe you know that for, for Kan people, they didn't have the written language at all, no. They didn't have that. Their history is very much passed on by their choirs, singings. And they didn't have written history. And it's not possible for them to have an exact date being recorded in the history at all. And you can see here very clearly they uh, fabricate a date. Okay. And um, if you're familiar with the Chinese history, you might know that this is a very big kind of thing happened in Chinese history in the year 1368. But it's a beginning year of Ming Dynasty. <laughs> so basically, they try to fabricate, they try to, um, to use the majority Han's um, history to, to show the close relation alliance of their own history there. So it's quite different from, you know, in the, in the, um, in the uh, camp people's um, grand choir, basically they, they are saying, they, they, they have expressions of a long, long time ago. Okay, they just say, they didn't have any exact date or time there. So in these in this, um, inscriptions of the statue, you can see, actually the elite villages or maybe some you know, local, uh, local uh, educated people are trying to do this kind of elite fabrication for them. This is the first example. Another example I observed in the village is that um, the, because of the fertility, uh, fertility culture in, in Zanli, um, they, they got a very mysterious kind of herb called Huang Hua Chao. I literally uh, change the flower herb. That means um, uh, traditionally it believes to it got the power to change the sex of the of the fetus. Okay, and and you can decide whether or not a boy or girl can be born in a family. But try to operationalize that kind of concepts and ideas and tradition. They build up 
two wheels in the village. One is called male wheel. The right side is called female wheel. That mean, meaning that if you drink the water from this well, you can born a, a baby can be born, a girl can be born there. So um, basically, these add the mysterious kind of elements of 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 their culture, of their culture there. So uh, these two will um, were constructed recently to illustrate the narrative around Zhangli's fertility culture. They used to provide the village daily water supply, basically, it's a daily water supply, but have been assigned new meanings relating to childbearing. And the drinking water from the male will is said to guarantee a boy, while drinking water from the female will produce a girl. This kind of narrative, however, oversimplified and reduced the fertility kind of culture to a gender selection kind of custom and distort the public kind of understanding of family culture. This is actually done by the elite, elite um, villages there. So here, very briefly, I give you some examples of what do I mean by elite fabrication, okay, at the local level. And um, uh, some dis dis discussions. Against the background of a rapidly expanding kind of rural tourism, the state power and the local ethnic Elites have played the key roles in formation of the ethnic minority culture and identity. I think they are the key two agents in these uh, social practice. And also, this approach of discourse oriented kind of ethnography and frame analysis can review the rules, systems, procedures that have shaped um, the order of discourse in this specific geopolitical kind of space. And my aim for doing this kind of research is going to this geopolitical kind of space and collected all uh, discourse related kind of material uh, that uh, linguistically and non linguistic material there as much as I, as many as I can and do the detail analysis behind. On the one hand, it highlights a power of discourse oriented kind of ethnography in observing and explaining the social world in a naturalistic and unmanipulated kind of way through the lenses of discourse and discourse analysis. On the other hand, Goetz and Goldman's work, especially frame analysis and provide us with a rich pool of terminology or dist uh, experience distant kind of conceptualization and for me uh, to draw on for further conceptualize the social reality. This is all my, all my uh, understandings, okay, open to further discussion for sure. And uh, a very brief kind of, because of the time, I observed the time, and uh, this is a very brief kind of uh, conclusion that I try to um, use to wrap up my talk today. This study reviews that the local governments have played the leading role in planning, implementing the strategies and measures while taking key to framing of ethnic minority areas as a common discursive strategy in this process of ethnic cultural reconstruction. And on the other hand, the local minority elites have responded effectively to the government strategies and worked to enrich the connotations of the cultural key frame, often by means of elite fabrication. Thus, the local ethnic elites have been not only the key barriers of the ethnic culture, but also its main exponents and advocates of such key frame, such key frame, okay? So much for my uh, very brief kind of introduction. If you are really interested in my work, you can you can borrow this book from Fisher Library or just uh, you know bought a, or your own version by own. Okay, thank you.